Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, as the case may be. I think, first of all, you should know that I'm roughing it here in January in Florida in uh, incredibly difficult environmental conditions to put forth this educational um, investment. What I like to do is talk about something that I think is probably the most useful aspect of muscle physiology in terms of understanding how muscle works. Um, there's a lot of different physiological tests, physiology being function as opposed to anatomy, which is structure, that uh, have been performed with isolated muscle um, and uh, as well as muscle in an intact individual using dynamometers, for instance, which we'll talk about in just a second, that have incredible utility for understanding how muscle works. Things like performing muscle twitches, um, where a uh, electrical impulse is used to fire one signal down a motor neuron to um, a motor unit or a whole, a whole nerve, um, and you produce okay, high tech, a small blip in force over time. You see a quiescent muscle, and then there would be a blip. And if a muscle were fast, you might see a force production like that. A slower muscle might give you force that would be produced more, more thusly. Um, or a fast motor unit or a slow motor unit. Hoping you can see those things. Um, and there are also things like work loops as well that can be done. Those are a little more complex to understand how muscle produces force. Um, in working conditions like locomotion and running. Why, for instance, um, as an example in rats, um, you won't see a training effect in slow twitch muscles like the soleus when the rats do very, very high intensity fast running because those soleus muscles are just simply too slow to produce force at higher speeds of running like on an incline. You need to use faster muscles because the slower ones simply can't because the foot turnover is so quick those uh, slower muscles can't produce the force. So work loops demonstrate that reason. That's a whole other topic. What I want to talk about today um, is something known as the force-velocity relationship. And um, basically, it's a relationship between the force to produce a muscle can produce and the velocity of contraction. So we have, as most of you know, concentric contractions, contractions, isometric contractions, eccentric contractions. So shortening um, and lengthening contractions being concentric and eccentric or eccentric as some people say to differentiate. Uh, I might use that term just so it's clear um, whether I'm talking about a, a shortening or lengthening contraction. Of course isometric is no change in length but the muscle producing force. So what we find use the black one here. If we set up force axes, force axis, excuse me, and a velocity of contraction, so this would be a shortening. This is velocity. Just missing that, I think. And this would be lengthening. So this would be negative, and this would be positive, so to speak, that when the muscle is forced to contract, you might have some isometrical maximal force that's produced. And then as a muscle that's being forced to contract is allowed to shorten, we get a little bit less force, and a little bit less force, a little less force. And eventually, as contraction velocity increases, we reach some maximal velocity. It could actually be tested directly or it could be estimated just based on the nature of this hyperbolic curve. The story is a little different when we do eccentric contractions. Eccentric contractions in the muscle that is isolated from the nervous system, so it's being artificially forced to contract. It's an artificially induced contraction. Um, will produce a lot more force during 
lengthening contractions. And this could be 60% or more of what you see here at your isometric contractions. Okay. So what we find, of course, in muscles that are faster, we'll use this pink color to be a really speedy muscle, is that it will have a higher maximal contraction. We're not going to go into what happens on eccentric. We'll just work, worry about the maximal velocity of contraction. A slower muscle, this red one here, would have a slower maximal contraction. So at Vmax, basically, it's just shortening and uh, it's unable to produce any force. If you ask it to produce force, then the velocity will then uh, be reduced. So if you ask it to produce force, a higher amount of force, that has to happen at a slower velocity, etc., etc., until we have Vmax. And then we get into eccentric contractions. In this case, you're forcing a muscle to contract and it's being forced to lengthen you get much more force that, than is produced during an eccentric or especially during any type of concentric contraction. Okay, let's see if I can erase my mess here. So this is the inherent nature by which muscle contracts during these different types of contractions. And what's fascinating, however, is that um, during voluntary contractions, you see a different type of curve. During voluntary contractions, we're going to just make this relative to some maximal voluntary isometric contraction. Um, we'll see a different shaped curve, a little bit flatter, and we're just going to relativize our velocity such that we reach a V max at whatever the V max is. So these could be different speeds. You're really comparing apples and oranges here when you're talking about uh, velocity because this would be in an intact individual um, and this would be velocity in a muscle that's been isolated from the skeletal system. Okay, so we see some difference there in the, in the curvature on these concentric contractions. But what's even cooler and this is where we're starting to get to some applications here, is that when you have someone produce a maximal effort, and this would be done in a dynamometer, imagine knee extension, where someone um, is at full knee extension, and you set up the dynamometer such that they maximally activate, and they maximally activate until the muscle hits maybe 90% of a max effort at full knee extension. And then they're doing this, and then the dynamometer forces their leg down. Okay, so it's a forced eccentric. This, my finger here is my, my knee <laughs> and my foot. There's my hip. Force into an eccentric contraction. You'll produce more force than you can eccentrically. There's no doubt there. And if this muscle were, act, were acting just as if it had an isolation, there were no nervous system involvement in what the muscle's performance was, you would expect a curve that would look somewhat similar here. And this is going to actually explain why this curve is a little bit flatter. Instead, what you find is that max efforts during eccentric contractions are maybe only 20, maybe 30 percent as great as the isometric. So this max eccentric effort there, it depends on which study you look at, which exercise, and of course which individual and their training status is much less. So the question then is, what is going on here? Why is there a difference? Well, the answer is, and we see this when you do EMG measurements, is there's inhibition. Your nervous system simply will not activate as much muscle or produce at least as much active, uh, electrical activity during maximal eccentric efforts in this laboratory situation. In fact, that's the nature of eccentric contractions. Eccentric contractions um, will require less activation because during eccentric contractions, muscle simply produces more force. So. Now we're going to get into some real world application here.
if you're going to perform repetitions with this lowering velocity and this lifting velocity. So let's say it's a bench press and you're worried about the pec major muscles. Here's our human in the dotted line here. Um, this is how much force can be produced at this shortening contraction. Okay, and then if you want to lower at the same speed and if you use the same amount of muscle, you would produce too much force such that you would never lower the weight. So in order to use lower the same weight that produces this much force on a concentric, you're going to have to use less muscle. There's going to have to be inhibition. It must occur. Okay, so if this is, I'm going to erase this here. To get the get these out of there if this is um, 80 percent of the muscle that you use and this is these are very in order to do this we need to have figure out how much muscle is going to get us a little bit less force such that maybe I'm going to just toss out a number you use, and you can actually calculate this to a certain degree, you might want to use more like 50% big question mark muscle such that the force velocity curve here dictates this force is just a little bit less and you lower at the same velocity okay and you see this with an EMG during concentric contractions the EMG levels go up electroactivity is higher and a lowering contractions there's less activity okay so that's the nature of a biceps curl too if you hook if you put an EMG electrodes on someone's bicep and had them lift and lower the same weight at a constant pace you'd find much more activity you do find much more activity it's not theoretical it's can be demonstrated time and time again during the lifting versus the lowering okay so this is the nature of um, the muscle activity in of itself as well as the as well so we have one the fact that muscle produces um, more force on eccentric contractions than concentric that's the nature of the muscles physiology and then we have the nervous system here such that even with maximal efforts we can't produce as much force in the muscle as we could as we would um, if there were no inhibition so something neurological inhibition is explaining this reduced maximal effort force there's also an important feature here too if for instance these numbers are just we're gonna just play off them just speaking purely hypothetically this isn't this probably wouldn't work out of those calculations have been done if we use 80 percent of our of the muscle available for the concentric portion of a particular rep and let's say that's I don't know it's a hundred kilo kilogram barbell or 225 pounds on a bench press okay you got two and a quarter in the bar that requires eight percent of the muscle that you have available in your pec as part of that movement and then we go down to where during the eccentrics you're only using 50 percent of that muscle um, that's much less muscle and we're, we're doing a very slow and controlled movement that's much less muscle that means the relative force per unit cross-sectional area is much higher here okay so let's think about that what, what does that explain for us one that explains the findings that eccentric contractions are very important for muscle growth Okay. It also explains that eccentric contractions produce a lot of damage because there's so much force relative to cross-sectional area. Okay. And we obviously know that if you don't work out, you won't get sore. 
Um, it's delayed onset muscle soreness, delayed after a particular exercise bout. So it's something about the force of contraction um, because you can't really extract that away from um, uh, an exercise, from, from, from exercise itself. So something about the force that produces the soreness and the damage, and there's initial damage followed by an inflammatory response, of course, too. But we're getting much more force relative to the, fi the fibers, relative to the, the contractile proteins being used, so much more damage there potentially as well. There may be something related to the direction of the, the filaments as they slide on one another. Um, so that's a, that's a feature as well, not just the force that's being produced. Another interesting thing too is that for a given amount of muscle being used, we can go back here now and look just simply at isolated muscle, forget the nervous system for a while, is that at a given velocity of contraction during eccentric contractions, let's compare this speed here, positive and negative, we're producing a lot more force here. So this is 60% above isometric, and that's maybe another, so this, this might be 100% more um, force compared to that at the same velocity of contraction. Okay, so what this suggests then is that the chemomechanical conversion of ATP energy, that's a fancy word, huh? Chemomechanical conversion of ATP energy into force is greater during eccentrics. Now we pay a price, damage could be part of that. We're disrupting the contractile apparatus. Um, the other price that we pay, which is when we want, a side effect could be muscle growth, um, sort of like repairing a callus. But what we find here that with so much more force, you also, you also have much less fatigue. So if you ever look at any of these muscle damage models where they just do eccentric only contractions, um, you can take someone's one rep max um, and have uh, your experimenters lift that weight for them and then have the individuals just lower it. And you can do 20 reps that way easily because the energetic cost is so much less. Um, it might be 25% depending on what speed of contraction you're comparing and which study you happen to look at, which movement. But it's much, much, much less. Um, there are iso isokinetic dynamometer studies. Uh, Paratesh has done this stuff. Scan Scandinavian research is well known, where individuals would do maximal sets of, um, I think they did like three sets of 10, 30 reps with a short, brief rest interval. Um, may have even done all 20 no it's th actually 30 reps right in a row it's three sets of 30 and you'll see like literally no fatigue over the course of 30 maximal effort eccentric only contractions pushing against a dynamometer so the third ramification that we see here that we get an idea from or about is the force velocity curve is eccentrics cause little fatigue so, add all this up, um, aside from the damage, which some people just like to feel sore, gives you an idea that you did something, um, but it certainly isn't the end-all be-all for muscle growth, but it's connected, is that don't skimp on your eccentrics when you're training. Um, those should be part, those, part those, should, those may be the most important part of your muscle growth. Um, you're lifting the load in a certain sense so that you can lower it. And produce much more force relative to the cross-sectional area. Um, so there's one other piece. I'm going to erase this. Start over here. We'll give you an extra, a bonus piece of info. Draw our same axes again. Actually, this time. Well, we're going to focus mainly on the concentric. So here's our force velocity curve. We'll just draw one for an individual so we don't get quite the up swing in force on the eccentrics. Here's force. This might be torque if you're measuring uh, 
the torque produced in a dynamometer type of setting in the lab. One thing that happens when muscle fatigues is it gets slower. Okay, and you can actually see this, anyone who's ever worked with um, electrical stimulation, sometimes you will see a muscle when you first, like a, even a TENS unit, if you've got enough muscle mass to see that there, um, or any EMS unit, um, if you've ever done any this sort of thing in a lab, for instance, or seen it done, um, when you first turn on that e the electrical stimulation, the muscle just springs into action, and if you do that repeatedly, it will sort of slow down. And so it, it almost becomes sort of an a, a amorphous blob, um, sort of um, jiggling under the force, under the contractions elicited by the EMS. So what we see then, if this is our VMAX, a couple things. One, of course, fatigue or force, maximal force is less. So I'm going to draw this one in red. and our maximal velocity is less, okay? So when you start off a set, and this is just sort of a, this is the type of thing you can bring up, you know, at um, uh, a family get together if you want to impress friends or family or what have you, um, is that when we start off a uh, given exercise and you're fresh, and let's say because you have the same external load, your weight is here, Okay, this might be 50% of your max effort or max isometric force. Okay, um, and if we tried to then, a couple ways we can look at this. One, in order to move, this is the velocity at which you move, in order to move the same weight at this velocity, if we use the same amount of muscle, you wouldn't get near enough force, okay? So in order to get this force with the fatigued muscle, which is the red line, we have to go to where the muscle can produce that much force, which is de facto going to have to be a slower velocity. So if you're going all out with a weight, you start off and you can move it this fast because this is the load, and then as fatigue ensues and you move from fresh to fatigued, in order to produce that same amount of force, um, you're going to have to move at a slower velocity. And also, this amount of force now was, let's erase this and make this, it was 50% of the max effort. And now it's become maybe 75%. Okay, and eventually, of course, if you take that to, um, uh, to failure, you're going to go slower and slower and slower because basically you're going you're gonna to have a new force velocity curve as fatigue ensues, and eventually your isometric force is equal to the, um, the force of the external load, and that gives you zero velocity, which gives you no movement, which means the set's done. <laughs> until someone pulls the weight off of you or maybe you're up you rack it because you planned ahead so the force velocity curve is um, really a phenomenal way of um, uh, understanding how muscle responds um, under conditions of fatigue it also explains muscle damage aspects of muscle growth um, and aspects of fatigue when you're comparing concentric and eccentric contractions um, not to mention that, of course, this tells us about fast versus slow muscle and fatigue versus fresh muscle, as I've mentioned. So, thanks for listening, and uh, it's going to be a tough day here in paradise. <laughs>